book of Jeremiah, and we are looking at chapter 30 today. Days are a coming, and they are. I'm going to do a little bit of a history. I mean, we've picked up a number of things, but we're going to do a little bit of a history of some of the timeline just to kind of get things into focus. And starts off with Jeremiah's birth. Now, when all of these numbers are BC, of course, you've got to add them up backwards because it counts down instead of up. So it's, it takes a little bit. Our minds are not used to seeing it that way. But so just you look at Jeremiah's birth and the call of Jeremiah, Josiah's reign. If you remember, Josiah was a good king. He started off being very young when he was made king, and he tried to change you might say, the, the nation of Judah to follow God. The people said they would, but they really never did. Um, and of course, then the scrolls were found in his time, which was the book of the law. Um, and that he had that read, and the people said, yes, we will follow all that was said, um, but they never did. And then in 605, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is a familiar name you might say to most of us, uh, that's when he began his reign, okay? Now, Zedekiah began his reign, but he was actually a puppet king under Nebuchadnezzar. Jerusalem had already been sacked by this time, but there was three deportations. We th a puppet. It says puppet. <laughs> it's, not even, it's not even supposed to be there. Uh, but it, uh, it's a puppet thing. I, I left. I left a letter out. <laughs> okay, good, good. A puppet. Okay. So he, in a certain regard, he had authority as a king, but as long as he did the bidding of Nebuchadnezzar, he was just fine. Now, as we go along, we're find out he didn't do that, and there was problems. But when we look at what had happened with him, it just gets fascinating, but we'll get to that in a second. Then there was the first exile, okay? When the Babylonians attacked and they carried off a bunch of people, Daniel was amongst those that were first taken in the, in the first exile. And we're going to see how that fits in here in just a few minutes. And then the second exile, that was in 787 BC, and then Jerusalem fell after a five-month siege. Now, you all know what a siege is, where the army surrounds it. Nobody comes, nobody goes. They build ramps, actually, to kind of breach the wall. Um, an interesting fact that took place in the middle of that was the fact that they were building the siege. They were surrounding the, the wall, and the Egyptian army came and attacked them. And the people of the Israelites thought that um, Egypt was going to save them. Nebuchadnezzar's army came off the siege for a little while, ended up defeating the Egyptian army, and then came back and continued the siege. It's one of those little tidbits in history that we call quite often myths. Okay? So, 10 years after Zedekiah became king is when Jerusalem fell the second time, you might say. Okay. So now looking at Jeremiah 39, verses 6 and 7, it just kind of helps get all this context here. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes at Rebla. And the king of Babylon also slew all the nobles of Judah. Then he then blinded Zedekiah's eyes and bound him in fetters of bronze to bring him to Babylon. Now, this was the cruelty that takes place. But you have to remember, Zedekiah was a puppet king of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar told him, don't defy me. Jeremiah the prophet also told him not to defy the king Nebuchadnezzar. Believe it or not, it actually says that Nebuchadnezzar was appointed by God, and he was God's servant. Now, it's actually mentioned more than one time. It's actually mentioned a few times. Now, it never once does it say that Nebuchadnezzar was a believer in the true God. But the other interesting little side note with this all 
is you wonder how in the world can these Israelites turn away from the one true God and constantly go after the false gods and how do they ever possibly get that mindset that that could possibly work? Well, there's an interesting passage that talks about this that we're actually going to look at a little bit more next week. But it talks about the fact that the children of Israel, the children of Judah at this time, they go to, Jeremiah tells them that they have to do what the God of heaven says, and they say, no, we're going to follow the queen of heaven because the queen of heaven has helped us all these generations. Now stop and think about it. You had the, constantly you had these evil kings and they were worshiping these false gods. And for a lot of them, things actually didn't go that bad. For some of them it did. So their mindset was, all these generations are surviving because of the fact that we can follow the queen of heaven and she will help us one of the false gods. <laughs> see, how, see how Satan operates? You have the king of heaven and you have the queen of heaven. See, you're going to twist it enough in order to make it sound like it's plausible. Satan, again, is no dummy. So he convinces the people that if they follow the queen of heaven, everything will be just fine. So you have the vast majority of the prophets and the teachers at that time are saying, don't worry, the Chaldeans, which are the Babylonians, Bel Babylonians are Chaldeans, say, don't worry about the Chaldeans because they're not going to succeed in taking Jerusalem. It's not going to happen. Jeremiah is standing almost alone saying, no, the opposite is true. You have to believe the God of heaven. Well, next week again, we're going to look more at the life of Jeremiah and the, all the difficulties that he had. So you've got the majority. Now, the majority are saying, don't worry. Egypt is going to save us. And of course, then Egypt comes and the Chaldeans leave. Well, they're starting to prove their prophecies true. In the midst of this, Jeremiah goes to Zedekiah, or says, Zedekiah comes to Jeremiah secretly and says, what does God really say? And Jeremiah says, surrender to the Chaldeans and your life will be spared, you and your family. In public, he does the opposite. And in real life, Zedekiah. Zedekiah the king is told by Jeremiah that God said, surrender. The vast majority of the people are saying, no, the prophets tell us that we don't have to, so we're not going to. So Zedekiah would be looked at as a traitor amongst his people if he surrendered. You want to talk about peer pressure? He was under a tremendous amount of peer pressure and he gave in to it. What I just read you is what happened because he gave in to it. He was captured by the Babylonians or the Chaldeans. He was set there. His kids were all brought together. All the nobles were brought together. Uh, the, the Chaldeans killed all his kids right in front of him. After they finished killing all of his kids, then they plucked his eyes out. And then they bound him and took him to captivity. Now, this was avoidable, but it was avoidable if he would have listened to God's voice through Jeremiah that was the lone voice instead, instead of the majority voice. There's a real lesson in there for us. Sometimes God will tell us something and all those around us say that can't be so. Now, it doesn't mean we just jump on the bandwagon and say, well, we, I thought God said. No, you have to know God said. And when God says it speaks to you, you know it. If you question it, it probably wasn't. I had a scenario like that a couple days ago where I had an idea popped into my head that I thought, well, this is a really great idea. I really ought to do this. You know, so I kind of prayed about it and I said, kind of, you know, I'm asking God, you know, is this that? And... It wasn't long. He said, no, it's just an idea that popped in your head. It really wasn't a good idea at all. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm glad I got clarity on that. Um, the moment I thought it was great, apparently it wasn't. So we just let it go. But as we go through this, we're also going to notice something about a dualness of prophecy. See, very often, as a matter of fact, almost the vast majority of the time when there's prophecy in Scripture, it has a dualism to it. In other words, it's talking about the people that it's written to at the time, but it's also talking about future events. Both are being talked about at the same time, in the same chapter, and sometimes you'll have a verse or a verse and a half that's talking to this group, and then a verse or verse and a half that's talking to this group, and then sometimes it's talking to both groups. As discerning those sometimes is a little difficult. Matthew 24 is a really good example of the difficulty in doing that discernment because it actually speaks to two different groups as it's going through, and you've got a few verses here, a few verses there, and, but anyway. We're gonna look at how this is a dualism in this prophecy. So you've got about the nation of Israel, or the nation of Judah, and the people of God, the two things that are being talked about. And this happens many times in Scripture. But the one constant that's always constant throughout all of it is God's protection of his people. Even in the midst of a disastrous prophecy for a nation, God's protection for his people is always there without fail. So Jeremiah 29 verses 10 and 11 is going to be kind of our beginning here. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. God is saying this for his people, he has plans. And those plans are always good. It may be a disastrous time that we're in. It may be horrible things that are happening to the, to the nation of Judah at this time. You've got the armies of the Chaldeans surrounding the city. And Jeremiah speaks the word of God saying, you know, I got good things planned for you. And the people, of course, are like, this ain't good. Okay, if this is good, I don't want good. But God is saying, his people, those that truly trust him and believe in him, he's got good plans. Now, those good plans may be part of this life, and they're definitely part of the next life. But God's plans for his people are always good. Okay, now we'll go to finally get started in our chapter 30, where our lesson is out of. Verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. Now, it's easy to miss the important factor here where it says write it in a book. Okay, that's different than writing in a scroll. How is that significant? Because a book would have been taken and would have been put into the library. A scroll might have been just set on the shelf. What God is about to say through Jeremiah needs to be written down because there are future needs of people to be reading this. Now let's look at that future, one, one of the future episodes of reading that book. In Daniel 9, verse 2, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books of the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Jeremiah the prophet had wrote down because God had him prophesy that the, the, the children of Judah were going to be taken to Babylon and after 70 years they'd be released to be able to come back. Daniel, who was a contemporary of Jeremiah, although Jeremiah was older, was reading the writings of Jeremiah in the book. That book was preserved and it actually ended up, or a copy of it ended up in Babylon with Daniel. It didn't just happen. Okay, And Daniel reads and he says, hey, look at this. 
God had promised that his people would return back home after 70 years. So he's starting to count up. You know, I've been here, you know, 20 years, 30 years, you know, 50 years. Um, you know, the, the time is getting shorter and shorter when people are going to go back. Now, Daniel himself never did return. But Daniel himself probably would have been in his 80s when that actually took place. And maybe even close, to, maybe even 90. If he lived that long, we don't know. But he knew that his people were going to be able to return. And now here's another interesting fact. Did they return because at the 69th year, all of a sudden they started turned back to God and repented and cried out to him? No. God had said, in 70 years, you're going to come back. God fulfilled that promise, even though the people themselves had not repented. Why did he do that? For the sake of those that are truly his and for the sake of his plan because what was going to happen in his, in his plan there was going to be a child that was going to be born in judah in the town of bethlehem there had to be the people had to be returned back for this to take place see god's plan is always part of our welfare of christ's work of redemption Throughout all of history, he is forming and guiding things to happen. Even in the midst of the failure of people, God's plan still always come around. Verse 3, For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I have given to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. The dualism here. Here's one of those dualism prophecies. The days are coming when I will restore the fortunes of my people. Stop. Israel and Judah. The Jews and the church. I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers. Back to the Jews. They're going to go back to that land of Israel. The land that God had given them. And they shall possess it. But that land is also that promised land. Yeah, but it's also the promised land in which we will eventually end up, which is heaven. That's the true promised land. See, we think of throughout all of these that the, that chunk of dirt over there is the promised land. It is in a certain regard, but in the big picture, no, it's not. That's not the promised land. The promised land is heaven itself. Verses 5 through 7. For thus says the Lord, I have heard the sound of terror or of dread and there is no peace ask now and see if a male can give birth why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth and why have all faces turned pale alas for that day is great there is none like it and it is the time of Jacob's distress but he will be saved from it there's a confusing set of verses isn't it you heard the sound of terror, okay? Terror, of course, is a lot of bad things are happening. And right now, in this part of history, a lot of bad things are happening. You have the army surrounding the sieges going on, and there's dread and fear, there's no peace, there's no hope. And then Jeremiah used that interesting line, and see if a male can give birth. Now that is almost kind of fits into our culture a little bit because there's some of that some of the answer yes, um, no they can't, okay, and this is the point that God is getting across. That can't happen. But why are they standing around and acting like that they're in labor? Because they're so distressed and so worried about what's going on that they can't function. His face is turned pale. There is hopelessness there. The hopelessness that comes when your trust is in the Queen of Heaven. Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. And it's the time of Jacob's distress. Okay, we've heard that line, Jacob's trouble. There's a whole series of them throughout Israel's history in which there is a whole lot of bad things that are happening 
to the Jews. And those are all times of Jacob's troubles. This is another one, the time of his trouble, time of his distress. But then I love that last line, but he will be saved from it. In other words, God's promises, even though it looks totally hopeless, even though there is just absolutely no way that this could come out good, God's promises that saying, but I'm still going to save you out of it. It might really get bad, but I'm going to save you out of it. Verse 10, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, and do not be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from afar, and your offspring from the land of their captivity. And Jacob will return, and will be quiet and at ease, and no one will make him afraid. Here again, this, the dualism of prophecy. Here's talking again about the children of Israel, the, the Jews, are going to return back to their home. It's going to happen. It looks like it's a hopeless case, that they're getting taken into captivity and you'll never come back, but you will. And they did. It actually, it actually happened. That prophecy was fulfilled on Israel's perspective. And I will save you from afar. In other words, God did not come and change the hearts and the minds of people so that they repented and turned back to him from a distance. He had things happen so that they ended up going back. See how that repentance factor wasn't even there? But God still fulfilled his plan, but he did it from afar. All the other times when we see this God rescuing his people, he comes close to them, he comes near to them. Because they're calling upon his name. But now he's doing it from afar. Verse 11, for I am with you, declares the Lord to save you, for I will destroy completely all the nations where I have scattered you. Only I will not destroy you completely, but I will chasten you justly and will by no means leave you unpunished. God says, I want to always be there for you. And the nations that have attacked you and taken you into slavery and the ones who you might say have caused all these problems, they're going to pay for it. Now that's an interesting thing because God raised up Nebuchadnezzar to be the king, raised up the Chaldeans to be a mighty army. And then after they completed the task that God raised them up to be, and it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar but it was later on kings. Um, actually, uh, it was his son Belshazzar, and then um, um, the um, the Medes and the Persians came in and took over. But God used them to accomplish His task, and then they were taken over. He used them to accomplish His task, and then they were taken over. Now, does that mean that God forced these people to do this? No. But God uses people, evil people, uh, by their own natures to, fu to fulfill his plan. But then there's that last part. But I will chasten you justly and will by no means leave you unpunished. The children of Israel, the children of Judah, who had sinned continuously, who did not repent, but God still saved them. And this is the truth for us today. It says... I will not leave you unpunished. If we sin against our God, and I'm talking about blatantly continuing to sin, God will punish us for that. But, at the, but he also says, but I will chasten you justly. In other words, the punishment will fit the crime perfectly. But there will be punishment. But it will be just. Verses 12 and 13, for thus says the Lord, your wound is incurable and your injury is serious. There is no one to plead your cause, no healing for your sore, no recovery for you. Now those sound like two hopeful, hope, hopeless verses. Your wound is incurable. Okay, now who has a cure for sin? Anybody here? A cure for sin. Right. 
Okay, so your wound is incurable. There's no healing for your sore. There's no recovery for you. On our own, we're hopeless. Hopeless and helpless. Because that disease of sin is no way that we can rectify it. But thanks be to God, he gave us Jesus Christ. Because he can, and he has. Verses 16 and 17, Therefore all who devour you will be devoured, and all your adversaries, every one of them, will go into captivity. All of those that are without Christ will go into captivity. Now here again, that's the dualism. Because every one of the nations that did attack and ended up being attacked, and they ended up going into captivity over and over again, but also all of those who are fighting on the army of Satan will eventually go into captivity of hell. He's talking about both. And those who plunder you will be for plunder, and those who prey upon you I will give to prey. Here again, this is what's going to happen to these nations that did this. It's going to happen to them. And it's going to continue on generation after generation, empire after empire. That will continue. For I will restore you to health. See, now you're speaking to his people. That incurable, I'm going to restore you to health. And I will heal you of your wounds, declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast, saying, It is Zion. No one cares about her. The world constantly says that Jesus, nobody cares. What can that Jesus do for you? Back in those days, it was Zion, Jerusalem, the whole concept of faith in the Creator God of the one true God, they didn't save you. Look what's happened. You weren't saved whatsoever. And that's the word always around us. All these bad things that happen to people, they say, where's your God? What's he done for you? Here's talking about the same thing. They say, where's your God? What's he done for you? We're all here in captivity. You're here along with me. Okay, you didn't escape. No one cares. Verse 21. Their leader shall be one of them, and the ruler shall come forth from their midst. They should be able to pick that prophecy up clearly. And I will bring him near, and he shall approach me. For who would dare to risk his life to approach me, declares the Lord. You see who is talking and talked about here? Doesn't that jump out at you? Yes. Look how he fits. See, this isn't a dualism prophecy. This is a future prophecy that has yet been fulfilled. Your leader shall be one of you. Was Jesus one of the Jews? From their midst, was he not born in the nation of Judah or Israel? And who would dare risk his life to approach me? Who can approach the Father directly? The Son. So you see this dualism here and that. Now this particular verse is in dual. It's straightforward. Verses 22 through 24. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Behold the tempest of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth, a sweeping tempest. It will burst on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and until he has accomplished the intent of his heart. And I'm going to leave that last line for a minute. You shall be my people. God has gathered out of all the nations his people and I will be your God. We are not only are we his people, he is our God. It is such a great thing when we th stop and think about that we are in Christ. But do you know what's a greater thing? That Christ is in us. We fail sometimes to recognize that truth. 
that the creator of the universe, the almighty God, indwells us. His wrath has gone forth. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until, see there's a limit, until he has performed and until he has accomplished the intent of his heart. All these things take place because it is the intent of God for them to take place. And he will not stop and change and there will be not be an end until he has accomplished everything that he set out to do. See, we think of him accomplishing everything he set out to do in saving us. It's true. But he also accomplished and set out to do the things that are going to take place for the people of the world who have rejected him. That's also part of his plan. And then, that last line, in the latter days, you will understand this. In other words, after a whole bunch of time has gone past, and you're looking back on history instead of forward so far, it'll make sense. See how some of the stuff that we pulled out of here would not have made sense to the Jews of Jeremiah's day. It would have been hard for them to pull that out. For us, we could grasp it. Why? Because we have the New Testament, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have history. God has proved himself to be who he said he would be over and over and over again. So we don't have to put our trust in the Queen of Heaven. But we serve a living God, an almighty God, an everlasting Father, and as we just learned, the Prince of Peace.